Hello, and welcome to another video on CPUs, VR, and iRacing. This time I'm going to go into an analysis with eight different CPUs. But first, here's the Radeon tracker. We're almost at a thousand, and I need your advice. When I get there, I'm not sure which Radeon to buy, so I just put up a poll. Here's what it looks like. I, it's public. I want you to go in and I want you to vote on which Radeon you want to see me test with uh, triples, single screen, VR, all that stuff. With today's testing, I have removed the GPU from being a constraint on results. I'm using my 4080 Super. This is basically the second fastest video card out there, arguably. And I've also decreased the resolution I'm rendering for the Valve Index. I'm rendering at 120 uh, super sampling percentage, which is about 2,208 by 2,452 per eye. It's pretty high, it's reasonable, but um, certainly within that card's capabilities. An important thing to talk about right off the bat is if your video card is more powerful than your CPU, and it can lead to some confusing results in which you might think that your GPU is underperforming, as in it's starting to idle more, it's not consuming as much power, its clocks are down. You might think, oh, wow, uh, I actually have a GPU limitation. That's not what's happening. It's more likely that your CPU is dragging down your GPU performance. So in this example, the strawberry line represents the CPU frame times, and they exceed our targeted 90 FPS. The yellow data is our GPU frame times, and we see about 5% of that data get pulled past that 11 millisecond line. This is not the GPU underperforming. This is the impact of the CPU bringing down the GPU's performance. If you have no idea what that chart was, um, the rest of this video is going to be confusing to you, but don't worry, I've got you covered. I have a video here, which is the intro to VR benchmarking with iRacing. I'm gonna go over how to read that chart, what it represents, some examples, the impact of motion smoothing, stuff like that. So I encourage you to take a look at that, five, 10 minutes, just click the link, and then come back here for the deep dive analysis on CPU performance. Oh. And I'm aware of one mistake I made in that video. Uh, the 144 hertz line is not supposed to be there. It's supposed to be here. Sorry about that. This table summarizes the CPUs I'll be testing today. There are no changes here compared to when I tested iRacing a couple months ago now. I think this is a good cross section of current generation and what's out there. Just a reminder, the 14th generation from Intel is barely any better than the 13th gen. If you can find a cheaper 13th gen, that's where your money should go, not into 14. Here's a quick glance at the motherboard and RAM that I'm using for each processor. And here are the software settings and the shared hardware. Here's a look at the iRacing settings that I'm using for the graphics and replay. Notice that I do not have SSR enabled, so no advanced puddle technology, and I don't have dynamic object shadowing on either. As per usual, I'm going to have the simulator footage also shown during the benchmarks. Um, this is the VR. It's just me wearing it during a replay, so it's not actually live gameplay. However, uh, I will send it up to the top. If you find this too distracting, if it should be the static uh, cockpit camera, uh, please leave a comment and I can change that for future videos. This bar graph is perhaps the most simple way I can show CPU performance. There are two bars. One represents the FPS, so in this case the headset's at 90 hertz, so it's 90 FPS, and there's a dashed line. That's the target. And the colored lines represent the CPU's ability to deliver the frames on time. This is a binary measurement. The frame is either on time or it's not. And if it's not, it'll drop down that average. So we look at the uh, Ryzen 5600, it's only 0.5 frames per second slower than the desired 90 FPS, but look at its on time. It's over 10%, it's 11% late. Beneath it is the Intel 9700K, and it is only 0.8 frames per second 
on average slower than the 5600, but notice the on-time percentage dramatically decreases. We go from 89 to 75%. This is why average frames per second is misleading when it comes to VR analysis and what is smooth. While the top five processors are able to deliver their frames on time, the 9700K is 25% late. That is going to be represented as stutters, frame spikes, things like that. This workload is way too intense for the Ryzen 2700. It's at the bottom of these charts. I'm not gonna talk about it much. If you're on this platform, I encourage you to upgrade. I'm going to use this frame time chart to better understand the VR performance. I have my valve index running at 90 hertz, which means we need about 11.1 milliseconds for our CPU frame time. Anything to the right of this line is late and potentially causing a stutter in VR. The data is shown here in an area chart, meaning all of the frames are contained within that blue area. We're looking at the 13700K in this example. And if I add in the 7800X3D, it would look like this. Unfortunately, this covers up some of the data. So instead of showing these area graphs filled out, I'm just going to show the lines. Now we can see the red line of the 7800X3D and the vast amount of its data is to the left of seven milliseconds. And this is well beneath the 11 millisecond requirement that we have for a stutter-free experience. The 13700K is also able to go to the left of 11 milliseconds, but you can see that its distribution of frame times does extend quite a bit farther than the AMD rival. To see if this is a unique advantage to the 3D vCache, let's bring in the results from the Ryzen 7600X, which yes, only features six cores compared to the eight, but they're at a higher frequency and without the 3D vCache featured on the 7800X3D. The strawberry line represents the 7600X, and it is surprisingly similar to the 13700K. Yes, the peak is a bit peakier, but the base of it, if you look at the bottom left and the right of the frame times, are very similar between it and Intel, and distinctly disadvantaged compared to the 7800X3D. If we just compare the 7800X3D to its little brother, the 5800X3D, we see a very similar sh uh, shape to the frame times being delivered. And I think that's attributed to the architecture, including 3D vCache. When I compare the 5800X3D to the other AM4 processors I have, we can see where the 5600 is struggling. And we can see that line, that purple tail go all the way out to the right. This means those frames are late. If I had a 5600X3D, I bet you it would look a lot more like the green lines we see for the 5800X3D. Looking at just the Intel chips, we have the dark blue line with the 13700K, the lighter line as the 12600K, and the white line, which is the 9700K. When a CPU is overworked, there's nothing you can do to make it run more efficiently other than reducing that workload, turning off mirrors, dropping quality, dropping rendering some cars, things like that. All right, now I'm gonna graph all CPUs at once. I know you didn't ask for this, or maybe some of you would have asked for this anyway. This is what it looks like. I think the big takeaway here is this frame time chart lets us see the headroom that's available to some of these CPUs. If we only look at the bar chart, we're not gonna get that same impression. So I think these have to go hand in hand in order to understand CPU performance and VR. So that was the Okiyama production car challenge an official series from a GR86 replay. And the results were pretty good. It's a challenging track, challenging situation with you know, the 3D foliage and curbs and all those graphic settings, but the processors did mostly pass the test. So now what I'm going to do is gradually increase the intensity of, uh, of compute and see which processors fall. Uh, and one way to do that is rain. 
In the next example, we're going to have a Mizano. Uh, it was a Battle of the Little Wings Week 13 race. Uh, it's intense rain, not as many cars, and only two mirrors. So let's check out those results. This bar chart looks very similar to what we just saw. However, notice that the Ryzen 7600 and Intel 12600K are both beneath that 100% CPU threshold. The Intel 13700K appears tied again with the two X3D processors, so let's look a little closer at the frame times. With only two mirrors activated on the Super Formula Light, it looks like the performance actually goes towards the 13700K's favor. When we compare the 7800X3D to the non-3D cached 7600X, we see a clear advantage once again. But the CPU frame times are just barely slipping from the 7600X, so maybe just adjusting one or two settings would bring this back into alignment and smooth performance. The 5800X3D stacks up well compared to the 7800X3D. We do see a little tail slip past that latency line of 11 milliseconds, but I'm rounding to the nearest whole percentage, so 99.98 actually looks like 100% in my chart. Compared to the other AM4 processors I have, the X3D cache is a big advantage and a recommended upgrade if you're on that socket. The Intel processors stack more closely, and I think you could dial in the light blue 12600K to get smooth performance, but the white line representing the 9700K, I think you're going to have to make big sacrifices to try and get smooth VR performance in this scenario. Here's the summary shot again with both the bar chart and the frame time chart, and it shows that the 13700K and the 7800X3D really do stand out from the rest. Their worst frame times resolve very quickly and before that 11 milliseconds. Increasing the computational intensity, here is Zandvoort in an IMSA series race. We've got almost 40 cars on track and three mirrors, but a dry, sunny race. The 5800X3D still shows a 90 FPS average, however it does blemish when it comes to the CPU frame times. And the two entry level processors on their respective platforms do take a big hit here. The frame time chart shows the 7800X3D with a slight edge over the 13700K. Both lose a couple frames past that 11 millisecond deadline, but not enough to change it from 100% average. Once again, the 3D V-cache on the 7800X3D gives it a distinct advantage over the 7600X, and the 5800X3D stacks up much better to its bigger brother. With just a few changes to the iRacing graphics, I'm sure the 5800X3D can deliver a great VR performance in this scenario. The purple line for the Ryzen 5600 shows a significant struggle in this scenario. A lot of graphic settings will have to be turned down to get it to run smoothly, if it can at all. Looking at the Intel chips, we see the white line for the 9700K. It's showing its age. It's a legacy processor. This workload is too intense. But I think the 12600K could pull off this scenario if you were running a single mirror, like the virtual mirror. Here's the Fruit Loop spaghetti once again, and I, I think the red line for the Ryzen 7800X3D stands out in this chart. And looking at the lines left to right, it's actually easier to see the stepping in performance between all the processors. And when we look to the immediate right side of that 11 millisecond timeline, we see that there's very similar performance between the purple 5600 and the Intel 9700K, which is white, and the Ryzen 7600 and the Intel 12600K. Now let's really crank up the intensity here. How about a GT3 race around Algarve or Portimao? This is a week 13 race with very wet conditions, almost 30 cars. It's very, very difficult to render all of this. And it's even more difficult to see, let alone race in, this condi in these conditions. The Porsche supports four mirrors, but quite frankly, I think the digital mirror in the dash is more useful. And adding that fourth mirror is just an, a, such a CPU burden that I, d I don't recommend doing it. 
Okay, let's look at the bar chart and right off the bat, we see a big struggle here for most of the processors. Although I am super impressed with the 7800X 3D. Somehow it is able to deliver 100% of the CPU frame times on time while the 13700K manages 9% late. When we switch to the frame time chart to compare these two processors, we see that there is a small red trail behind the 7800X uh, 3D and that 11 millisecond line, but it's not enough for uh, my numbers to round it down. So it's still recognized at 100%. This is the first scenario where the 13700K falters with 91% of its uh, frame times delivered on time, 9% late. Dropping a mirror or reducing some settings should bring that back into smooth gameplay. Comparing the 7800X 3D to its 7600X, we see the big advantage that 3D vCache offers in this scenario with rain. But that cache is not enough to help the 5800X 3D, shown here struggling. However, it does fare much better compared to the other AM4 processors I have. I mean, the Ryzen 2700 has all of its data points to the right of 11 milliseconds. It would be unplayable. FPS VR doesn't show frame times greater than 30 milliseconds. It just puts them all in one bucket, and that's why we see that spike at the end. Looking at the Intel chips, we see that the 12600K really struggles here and a bit surprising compared to the 13700K. I think if you're on an entry level 12th gen Intel, it's worth considering the 13th or 14th uh, series. And now for the group photo, I have dropped the Ryzen 2700. There's just no point in showing its data here. You're going to want a current generation CPU to handle this extreme scenario. Speaking of extreme scenarios, some of you might recall this replay. This is an IMSA Daytona Night 50 car replay. It's AI, so the cars are really tight and compact. And this is a torture test. And I also didn't turn off any of the night lights or any of the shadowing here. So that is playing an impact on this performance. But because I did this for the triple screens, I thought, you know what? I might as well show it here as well. These results also seem to line up with what we had previously seen. The 7800X 3D is in front of the 13700K. The 5800X 3D is better than entry-level processors on AM5 and uh, LGA 1700. And the legacy 9700 Intel is actually pretty close to the AMD 5600. When it comes to the frame time chart, this thing is a mess. I don't think there's any proper analysis that can come out of this, especially because after 30 milliseconds, everything gets tossed into a bucket and there's no more analysis that can be made there. So that concludes my CPU analysis with iRacing and VR. Uh, hopefully you found it interesting and informative. Let me tell you, it takes a lot of work to not only collect this data, but to try and find ways to crunch it and graph it, graph it so that there is a, a meaningful way for you to understand that. And then I have to do all that video editing. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work. So if you like this content, please like the video, subscribe to the channel. I would really appreciate that. And if you want personal advice on a PC upgrade that you're thinking about, just send me an email at uh, benchmarkodysseys at gmail.com. Uh, I think it's also in my about tab. Oh, and speaking of tabs, make sure you go to the community tab because that's where that poll is for the Radeon graphics card. My plan is to benchmark the 4080 Super against the 3080 Ti and then have the, um, the Radeon product after that. I don't know which graphics card because I don't know what you've voted for yet, but uh, that's the plan. So uh, until then, uh, adios.